fair, man. I wonder if John Whitaker knows anything about this tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. That's good. If you have your Bibles, I hope you have, folks. You can't go to war without a weapon. We war a warfare. Believe me, we're in war. We fight many battles in that war, but we are in a war. You may not be serious, but Satan is. If you have it, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 7 and stand with me tonight, please. We open the book. The book. The book. Genesis chapter number 7 and verse 1. Now, as I've said to you before, I believe the Bible. A lot of folks believe the Bible is nothing but a bunch of uh, myths and uh, ancient allegory and what have you. And therefore, they rob it of its ability to speak to us by doing that. But I believe the Bible is historically accurate and correct. And I believe what you're reading here is an historical event that took place. So the book of Genesis, chapter number 7, verse 11, one verse, it says this. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Father, bless the book. Give me unction to preach it tonight, Lord, for just a little while. I, st I stand between time and eternity. Bless this book. In thy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. There's one in here tonight much greater than me, folks. Take heart to his word. Listen to it carefully. Five times in the Word of God, the Bible said the heaven was open. Five times. I'm going to cover all five of them tonight. I'm not going to preach all night long, but I'm going to cover five of them. Five times heaven is open. The first time it's recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter number 7, it's in reference to a universal flood that came upon mankind. Now, most evolutionary geologists, most uh, unbelieving geologists die, deny such a thing as a universal flood. But Dr. Henry Morris, who's gone on now to be with the Lord, was a wonderful uh, man. He was uh, considered by, by any who knew anything about his credentials to be a scientist. And Henry Morris believed in a universal flood. As a matter of fact, I believe he started the Creation Science Inst uh, Institute, or he started it, or, or joined it, or whatever. But he's associated with it. And he tells us that in over 200 separate cultures on this earth, over 200 they have a direct record of a universal flood. They either have some kind of a historical record of it or they have some, some kind of a story about it. But in over 200 places on this earth, they talk about a universal flood. Dr. Henry Morris talks about the Colorado River that cuts its way through the Grand Canyon. He said there is no way that the force and power of the Colorado River could possibly cut in a trillion years the Grand Canyon. He said it took a powerful universal flood with enormous strength to cut that gorge as you know it today. Yet scientists, so-called scientists, continue to tell people that the Colorado River over vast eons of time sawed its way, cutting deeper and deeper into the gorge and produced the, uh, the uh, 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 Grand Canyon. <laughs> My mind's leaving me tonight. I'd like to see it someday, and when I stand on the edge of it, I'll say, thank God for what He's done, and for His wonders, and for His power, and for His ability. But my friend, the Grand Canyon's a pile of rock, and if He saved one soul, He did more in saving one soul than He could possibly do in cutting the Grand Canyon. So my friend, I believe in a universal flood. The fossil record is replete with testimony time and time and time again of a universal flood. And other independent geologists have found in, in their excavations and their work at the 14,000 foot level of Mount Ararat, they have found great deposits of salt that were brought there by water. In plain words, at one time, Mount Ararat was completely covered with water. And if you know your Bible, you know what landed on the top of Mount Ararat. You'll know it was the Ark of Noah. And Noah, by the way, if you don't know what his name means in Hebrew, it means rest. And God said, I'll give you rest through my man Noah. Noah was one who brought the old world over to the new world. And he brought eight souls, seven with him. He made the eighth. 
And the number eight in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. And God put a bow in the clouds and said, I'll never destroy the earth again with a flood. The next time, friend, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. God's going to wipe from existence all that has ever been known by sin and ever perverted it and corrupted it. So has there been a universal flood? Yes, heaven opened. Yes, it did. And when heaven opened, the Bible says the waters came out of the heavens and they covered the earth, even to the top of Mount, uh, Mount Everest, 29,000 plus feet. The waters prevailed upon the face of the earth, and every living thing that had the breath of life in its body died. As a matter of fact, in the geological record, if you want to take time to look into it, even huge masses of fish, because of this power of this water that was moving at that time, can be found buried in strata. Buried even fish that could live in water, yet the power of the water was so great that it literally came down upon them and just clapped them down. And you can see them in there as they're moving. You can see the creatures in the water as they're trying to move away in their vast deposits of these creatures all over the earth. There because of a universal flood. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that God opened heaven. When He opened heaven, He opened the place where the waters came down. According to the Scripture, there are three heavens. There is the first one right above your head where principalities and power and spiritual wickedness in high places resides. This earth is literally covered with a canopy of demonic power. It's everywhere. To go up or to come down is to go through it. Maybe that explains why NASA, even NASA, has multitude of video and photographs of UFOs. And they don't want you to know about it. Do they want you to know about it? I don't know. But I know this. I know that they have recorded time and time and time again as they go up through the atmosphere and as they come back down through it, They've recorded all these UFOs. A UFO, friend, is a product of demonic power. There are no little green men living off in some planet somewhere. It's part of the last day deception to prepare men and women to receive the lie. It is a powerful entity. Once again, nobody even has a clue what a demon is, much less where it came from. The old ancient Greek philosophers said that a demon was a good thing to have, that it gave them wisdom and authority, and it was something to be sought after. My friend, this shows you the vast difference between the Bible and secular wisdom. For in the Scripture, it is translated by the King James translators, when they come upon the word diamonion, they translate it unclean spirit, wicked spirit, vile spirit. That's how the Bible translates them. So the first heaven is where these spirit beings are located. The second heaven is the stars and all of the known universe that mankind understands it to be. However far it goes, it's not infinite. The only form one that is infinite is God, the Creator. Everything else has a start point and a stop point. There's an end to it. Except the one that liveth from everlasting to everlasting. But then there's the third heaven. The third heaven. Where is that? The third heaven is where God Almighty has carried what we understand to be heaven. It is where He has that beautiful celestial city. That city that He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to Myself. John said, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That new Jerusalem is in the third heaven. But friend, there is a place that there is no place. And that's where Almighty God resides, always has, always will. He must make a place for His creatures. That's us. And one day we'll be where He is. We won't need a heaven like the heaven that He has now, where it's a place where where this beautiful city is located. When you leave this world, friend, if you want a box somewhere in glory, you can have it. If a street of gold is what you're looking for in eternity, have at it. If walls of jasper and gates of pearl is all you believe eternity is about, you miss the mark. One day I shall see Him as He is. I will know that eternal, infinite, almighty being that, my friend, no thing could ever replace. Amen. So we'll see Him as He is. Just that will blow you away for the next trillion years. You know, that's something to talk about. Have you seen God? Did you see Him? Look, did you see Did you really see Him? Did you take it in? Could you really uncomprehend what you saw? Back and forth and back and forth. 
when you begin to talk about that eternal being. Amen. We know His name is Jesus. The second time the heaven opened is in the book of Malachi, chapter number 3 and verse 10. The Bible said, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That's good. Everybody wants to be blessed. How many in here tonight would like to be blessed? How many want to be cursed? Raise your hand. Nobody wants to be cursed. You all want to be blessed, right? I understand that. Take a survey out here of the average Joe on the street. How many want to be blessed? Everybody throws their hands up. How many wants to raise? How many? Everybody's hand goes up. Everybody wants the good things. Well, God tells you how to have them. Here's what He says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. This I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Luke chapter number 6 and verse 38. The Lord Jesus said, Given it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. And Paul tells you the motive in giving, how to give. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. You say, well, what's that got to do with Malachi? It's got everything to do. For Malachi said, bring your offerings into the storehouse. Give your gift to God. Acknowledge the supremacy in His life over even your pocketbook. And God will pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. So I'm not, no, I don't know it, preacher. Try it. Put it into the test. Amen. That's always been what I say to people. Try me, he said. That's what he said in Malachi. Put me to the test, he said. He said, I'll make him mad. No, you're grumbling and, cry- and complaining and grappling about not being able to pay your bills. What makes him mad? When you, when you give to God and sow into Him what that Bible says, sowing into Him, then, my friend, you have done what God said to do, and He will restore you. He said, cast your bread upon the water, and I'll give it to you back, even as much as a hundredfold. Second time heaven opens... It has to do with blessing. Third time heaven opens is in Luke chapter number 3, verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open. Third time heaven opens. And when does it open? It opens for the blessed Son of God. God opens heaven. And He puts in, He looks down. There's got to be something more here simply than some cloud parting. If heaven is open, that means that you're looking off into eternity. You're looking into the third heaven. You're looking into where they never die. You're looking into where they never age. You're looking to the land that is fairer than day. And here the Bible says it looked down upon Jesus. And the Bible says a voice came down from heaven. The Holy Ghost in the form of a dove. And the Scripture said the voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I'm happy with Him, satisfied with Him. He pleases me. And He always did. Heaven opened. For this accursed earth to understand that God was well pleased with His Son. Has he, ever been, has he ever been let down by Him? Has the Lord Jesus ever failed Him? He never has and never will. To this very moment in eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ pleases the Father. And that's why He came. And that's why He is. Notice the fourth time that heaven opens. In Acts chapter number 7 and verse number 56. Heaven opens again. And here it says in Acts seven fifty six, And said, Behold... I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. My goodness gracious, this is a big deal for a creature. For Stephen was a creature, just like I am, just like all the rest of them. But he was a man of God. Stephen was a preaching deacon. He was a deacon that preached. Somebody said, I don't believe deacons can preach. He preached. And he was a deacon. He's one of the first ones chosen in the book of Acts plainly says that Stephen was among those that were chosen. And he preached the Word of God. And he made the Jews mad. And the Bible said because he made them mad, they, got, they gnashed at him with their teeth. If you read the 8th chapter of Acts, I think that's where it's located. The 8th chapter of Acts is the sermon of Stephen. And that sermon carries Israel all the way back to Abraham, the creation, all the way up to the point where they are now rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ for the second time. And Stephen's message is rejected again. Israel has rejected one more time the gospel of Christ. Their blindness now is complete. It's finished. And the Bible says heaven opened, 
And when they were about to stone Stephen to death in the stone, as he was dying, literally, the stones were pouncing upon his body. He looked up into heaven and he saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. That had to have been the sweetest death this earth has ever known. The Lord Jesus beckoned his saint on home. He stood up and extended his hand. And as his soul and spirit departed that lifeless body, it fell back to the ground under a pile of stones. But they could do nothing to his soul and spirit. Fear him. Fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear him that can destroy the body. But fear him. I say, I war for one you whom ye shall fear. Fear him that hath power. To cast both your soul and spirit into hell, fire and damnation. Fear him. Fear him. And so he called Stephen from this body. You're going to leave the body. I know you're taking the best care of it you can. Some of you take a whole lot of good care with your bodies. Feed it well. Give it plenty of rest. Keep it clean. It'll serve you reasonably well. You know, take good care of it. I was looking in the mirror the other day. I stopped one time and looked in the mirror like scared me to death. I thought, Lord of mercy. Is that what I look like? And what happens? You see, I was coming up on my 65th birthday. And I thought, well, I look like something fell out of the back of a hearse. Say, man, <laughs> that's what happens to this old body. It just wears out, folks. Keep it clean, pamper it, wash it, feed it, rest it. But it's going to wear out. Amen. I'm glad it's not me. I'm glad it's not. I'm glad that this body one day will fall away. But I'll sail free. Amen. I am not my body. I live in my body. I use it. When I'm done with it, I'm done with it, brother. When I'm done with this flesh, I'll not come back and pick it, pick it up again. I'm finished with it. Amen. And it's not me. I wash it every day. I don't want to go around stinking. I feed it well. You can tell by looking at me. I feed it pretty good. I exercise it. I try to get out and run three or four times a week, maybe three, two. Sometimes I only run one time a week. Sometimes I'm sorry, low down, lazy. I can't get out and do anything. But I do the best I can with it because I know it's the only one I've got. Take that to heart. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is. Take care of it. That's the only one you got. But folks, the day is going to come when it gives up the ghost. And it can't serve you anymore. It was never made for eternity. It's made for the earth. And God said, Adam, from dust thou art to dust thou shalt return. You can go over here where the archaeologists are digging the Holy Land, digging in Egypt, digging over here in Turkey, digging all over the world. And they go down and they start digging. Some places they find bones. Some places they don't even find bones. All they find is dust. So who do you know? Who was the dust? It's where they came from. It takes God to reach into the dust and pull it up and create a civilization. And He's the only one that can do it. From dust you are. And to dust you shall return. Now here's the fifth time that heaven is open. Revelation chapter number 4. And I want you to look with it tonight with me carefully, please. Because I'm going to bear here just a little while. The fifth time that heaven opens is in Revelation chapter number 4 and verse number 1. The Bible said, And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And this door cannot be reached by a satellite, by any physical means, by any, any technology we have. Forget it. It's not going to work. This door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. So by invitation, the Apostle John is allowed to go through this door into heaven. Notice carefully what he said. And he said, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Well, John was caught up into the third heaven. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 said, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Revelation 19, verse number 11. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's the final fifth time that heaven opens. You see, before that, just a door. John goes through a door. Now heaven opens. And when it opens, this great white horse comes out with a rider upon it. And when he comes, he comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now this heaven is looking into the third heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said, Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Dr. Maurice Rawlings, I met and I knew personally. And he's a very... He's, he's, a, he's a man with an enormous amount of experience because he's a cardiologist. 
And you've all heard the story, but I want to read it to you tonight. I'm going to give you some information that this man has on his website. He has condensed a lot of his work into one small area. And he's talking about people who've crossed over and come back. And he gives a definition that you need to understand tonight because it's very important to understand this as it relates to all of the out-of-body experiences. He categorizes it four ways. He says this. He says that there is a near-death experience when you almost die. And some folks say they see their life flash before their face. They're almost dead. They almost die. But they're spared. Apparently, they never lose consciousness or what have you. Then there is an out-of-body experience when their soul and their spirit sails out of their body, or leastwise their soul. And they're able to look down and see objects and this and that and so forth, or communicate and what have you. Then there is the third one, which is called clinical death. Clinical death is when the heart stops beating, the eye pupil dilates. In other words, it stays open, doesn't move at light. And from every indication, the body has experienced clinical death. And if something is not done, the body will move into what's called biologic death. Biologic death has associated with it rigor mortis. The body gets stiff. It's dead. The brain cells have died to the point where nothing can be done. The only thing left for a biologically dead, dead body is a resurrection. And there's only one who can raise the dead. But he can raise the dead. So Maurice Rawlings makes a clear distinction in these, and the reason he does is because of what it tells, or what it talks about. And a lot of folks need to hear this because there's an awful lot of misunderstanding and deception and lies out there today as it relates to death and dying and out-of-body experiences. Maurice Rawlings says that you can have out-of-body experiences through deep hypnosis. That'll do it. He says you can see a guru in India learning meditation techniques with a mantra. You know, kundalini yoga, Rick Warren, tantric sex, mysticism, the whole nine yards of the of the emerging church movement, they're messing around with this kind of thing, having out-of-body experiences. That's what's happening, folks. And that's what's coming to Knoxville. They've already got yoga classes in Clinton and in Knoxville and in the surrounding area. And you can't have part of it without having all of it. If you start with yoga, you'll go with yoga, and yoga will take you to kundalini yoga which is the serpent power rising up over the top of your head through the seven chakra points in your body, and it will literally enslave you in demonism. And you can have an out-of-body experience. You can go scrying. I don't know what that word means with a crystal ball. You can have chemical hypnosis, he says. You can have electrical stimulus of the brain. In plain words, what this doctor has done, and he's speaking as a scientist, has done is to tell you that you can have out-of-body experiences by a lot of different means. And these out-of-body experiences run the gamut as to what you experience. And, and here, now listen, this is important. The bookshelves are full of books written by people who question people who've had out-of-body experiences. And I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but the vast majority of their experiences are good. Being of light. I was in this wonderful garden. Oh, the sweetness and the goodness that I felt. Oh, what a wonderful thing it was when I had my out-of-body experience. That happens. They're out there. They lead you to believe that everybody, regardless of whether you're a Christian or whatever you are, when you die, we all go to the same place and have a wonderful out-of-body experience. Maurice Rawlings cuts to the chase. Belies the lie, shows you what the lie is, and shows you what's going on. And I'd like you to listen to him tonight. The man's gone on now. Maurice Rawlings has gone on to be with the Lord. But if there ever was a doctor, a cardiologist, if there ever lived a doctor on this earth that was concerned for the souls of men, it is Maurice Rawlings. And the reason for that is because of the experience he had. Now, I've told you his experience, but I'm going to read it for you tonight. I want you to hear what this man said. Here's what he said when he had a man by the name of Charles McCaig. He's a 57-year-old mail carrier. He's having chest pains. 
We took him to the office, put him on the treadmill. He got his chest pain again. He was attached to an EKG. And the EKG, EKG went haywire. We knew he had chest pain, but before we could stop the machine, he dropped dead. Now, understand, this is the doc talking. In plain words, he put his stethoscope to him, whatever he had in that office, he put it to him, he pronounced him clinically dead. Okay? If the doctor said he dropped dead, he dropped dead. But when he dropped dead, he had a very peculiar situation. He convulsed like most people do when they first die, and the heart stopped providing blood to the brain. His eyes rolled up. He turned blue. He stopped breathing. The nurse started an IV, and I started an external heart massage. The strangest thing happened when I stopped resuscitating to put in a pacemaker. And now the man speaks himself. He says, when I came to, Dr. Rawlings said my hair was literally standing on end. My eyes had already started dilating. I was absolutely scared to death. I was horrified. My life was very normal, he goes back to say. I partied a lot. I had joined a church at a young age. Because of my parents, I really didn't realize what church was about or what accepting Christ was about. Early one morning at work, I'd walk to the local clinic in my hometown. At that time, I thought I might be having a heart attack. So when I met Dr. Rawlings, he kept me for about three or four days. Then he gave me a, tr a stress test. I remember while taking it, I felt like I really wanted to get off. And that was the last thing I remember of that. When I came to, Dr. Rawlings was giving me CPR, and he asked me what was the matter, because I was looked so scared. I told him that I had been to hell, and I need help. Here's what he said. Here's what the doctor said to him. Keep your hell to yourself. I'm a doctor, and I'm trying to save your life. You need a minister for that. Now, this is a real situation. We've got an atheist doctor and an atheist patient. The atheist doctor is trying to revive the atheist patient. Neither one are believers in the Lord Jesus. All right? Soon a nurse named Pam said he needs help. Do something. At that time, Dr. Rawlings told me to repeat this short prayer. All right. You're going to bug me to death. He looked back in his memory and he said, repeat this prayer. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus, save my soul. Keep me alive. If I die, keep me out of hell. That's what the atheist doctor said to the atheist dying. He gave him that prayer. That's a pretty good prayer. After that, the other fading out experiences were very pleasant. I saw my stepmother, my mother, my mom passed away when I was about five months old. I never saw a photograph of her. My stepmother passed away about ten years ago. I did not have any contact with them all. All I could remember was that they kept their hands reached out to me. I heard it said that if you, could, if you couldn't carry money with you, and when I was with my mother and stepmother, I saw they had no pockets. I know that sounds weird, but I was trying to remember everything I saw. After that, I remember walking down a lane that had colors on both sides, brilliant colors. I had a little experience in art, but nobody, not even Rembrandt, could reproduce those colors. They were so bright. There was this light that surrounded me. I believe it was the Holy Spirit. It sounded, surrounded me and took care of me. I've never felt so good and so safe in my whole life. After he prayed, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus, save my soul. Keep me alive. If I die, please keep me out of hell. After this was all over, Dr. Rawlings said, I realized what really happened. It was a double conversion. Not only had this make-believe prayer converted this atheist on the floor, it had also converted this atheist doctor that was working on him. Dr. Rawlings points toward himself. That is the only reason I can appear to you now to tell you that there is life after death and it is not all good. <clears throat> Most of you can tell the difference between simple fading, clinical death, and biologic death. Take the case of Charles McCaig. He was on the treadmill and I could tell that he was in clinical death, dropped dead, no heartbeat, eyes dilated, no movement, no breathing, no pulse, nothing. That he, was in, that he was in clinical death. He had a startled question on his face. He was about to ask the question and was looking dumbfounded at me. As he was walking on the treadmill, I noticed his heart had stopped and his breathing had stopped. He was still walking and talking for a minute or two before the lack of blood to the brain caused him to drop dead. Did you hear that? It takes a physician to observe something like this. 
there was enough blood moving in his brain to keep him going. He said uh, he was dead and didn't even know it. I should have told him. <laughs> Soon we started clinical death treatment, CPR. We started the heart up again. We started the breathing again. And he came back. This was clearly clinical death. Biologic death would have occurred if four to six minutes time had passed after clinical death. Because of the lack of oxygen to the brain, the brain cells die. They are the most sensitive cells in the body. Then rigor mortis sets in, and the person becomes stiff as a board. And now we need resurrection, and only God can do resurrection. We can only do resuscitation, something we are permitted to do. Now, good doctor, I believe you. I believe him. What's he got to gain? He didn't want your money. We had him in here, and he wouldn't take a dime. <laughs> So give your money somewhere else. Put it, give it to, to a missionary. He's not in to make money. Never was. He wanted to help you. And if your heart stops, okay, if it stops beating, I don't know how long it takes after the heart stops beating for your spirit and your soul to leave your body. I don't know who knows that. But I do know that the Bible definition of death is this, that the body without the spirit is dead. Now, if your time comes, are you going to be ready to go? Now, please understand something. Time comes for little six-month-old babies. I've been in the hospital where I was told, now we're going to have our baby. And the doctors have said it's only going to live about five hours. And I remember sitting in that room with that mother. She held that precious little thing in her arms and had its little head because it only had about half a head. And had a head wrapped up. And she sat there. And she held it and she kissed it and she, and she caressed her little baby. And it lived about five hours. The doctors were pretty well right on. And then it died. And then they put it in a little casket about that long. And then we went out and we buried it and we had us a service. All right. But I've also been in the, in the intense. I've walked into the, IC, the ICU trauma unit. And I walked in there and there was a little 14-year-old girl, 14 years old, 14, 14. And she had a respirator down her throat. She... She was, she, I looked at her and I looked very carefully at her. And the moment I walked in the room, I said, there's nobody in here. She was already gone. They were keeping her body alive. And I'm not criticizing them. That's their 14-year-old daughter. She was gone. She was gone. 14. I have been to so many different types of funerals and seen so many different types of deaths that it absolutely, it dumbfounds me. I could sit down and begin to think at night about all of the death that I've seen since I've pastored this church. Dead people, no warning. No warning. If you think everybody gets a warning, you're watching too much TV. Where are you going when your time comes? Where are you going? This man dropped dead. God was gracious to him and let that doctor resuscitate him. And that doctor gave him what he needed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was in his shame. This man said he was in a church and didn't know a thing about salvation. Heaven opened. Heaven opened. And when it opens, friend, it will open for you. Or hell will reach up to receive you. And the Bible said hell is never full because it enlarges itself. It has a rapacious appetite. It reaches up and it takes and it pulls down and it is never satisfied. Hell. Which one is it tonight? There's only one that can keep you out of hell. That's that God man that I preached about this morning. The Almighty. Father in Jesus' name. Maurice Rawling, Lord, he's gone. He's with you now. He's with you. And his legacy, his legacy remains, Lord. What he said is still with us. What he, what he said in his life that he lived. And he was true to the last, as far as I know, to the last breath he ever drew in his body. True to you and true to the Word and true to the truth. And now a website carries all that work that he did and all these testimonies, videos and audios and CDs and so forth. 
If there's somebody in this house tonight who's heard this, this first time you ever heard it, you heard about a man screaming, scared to death, going to hell, how do you think you're going to react? God, speak to them. Speak to them. In Jesus' name we pray. If your head bowed right now, you don't have to move. You don't have to do a thing. You don't have to say a thing. I'll help you. I'll help you. If you're watching by the way of the Internet, whatever you're doing, I'll help you. I cannot save you, but I can tell you who can. If you'll bow that head in your heart and your soul before your Maker and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell, and I want you to save me. However the words come from your heart and from your soul, you frame them. But you want Him to save you. You want Jesus to be your Savior. Receive Him into your heart. He'll save you. You'll never have to worry about going to hell. Would you like to do that with me tonight? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone who might be calling on your name right now. Lord, I'm just a preacher. Lord, you know that. Just the preacher. But for those who are calling on your name, I pray in Christ's stead that they'd call upon you and just ask you to save them and believe on the Lord Jesus as their Savior and receive Him into their heart. Trust Him. Trust the Lord Jesus. In Thy holy name tonight, we pray. And for Jesus' sake, we ask it. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to go to hell. It's wonderful. You don't have to. I preached the message in here probably about four or five months ago. And I remember that message. If you remember when I preached that message about hell, you remember what I said about it? I said, the greatest tragedy of hell. What was the greatest tragedy of hell? You remember what I said it was? You don't have to go. You don't have to go. That's the greatest tragedy. You don't have to go. And it is. You don't have to go. Let's stand up tonight and sing. Let's go to the Reese Rawlings. Good doc. Are you washed in the blood? Another verse, brother. Amen. This says Dr. Maurice Rawlings, M.D., a heart surgeon, has written a number of books in the death experience, clearly shows from his own practice, from the experience of his patients, that not everyone goes to the light when they die, where there is total love. Many of his patients, after being resuscitated on the operating table, Many of them, he said, spoke about hell. You know something? If you were a doctor, if you were a doctor like this man and go to work every day, and here you are day in and day out, and these people coming back screaming and scared to death with the looks on their face, I think that'd kind of stir me up, wouldn't it, you? The truth of the matter is that this doctor right here, this, this, this heart surgeon, sees more reality during his week of working as a doctor than most churches see in their lifetime. Because most of what goes on in most churches is nothing but a fake and a put on. One more verse.
thank you for listening to me. May God bless you for coming, and may His Word, folks, forget the church house. You can be saved anywhere you are. You walk out this back door tonight, don't let the devil tell you it's over. It's not over till the Holy Ghost has withdrawn Himself from you. And as long as there's conviction, the Holy Ghost hasn't left. And so if you're out here somewhere at your work or whatever, you can fall on your knees out there on the ground, and you can be saved. I was saved outside of a church house. How many in here were? A good half of you, two-thirds of you. Most of you were saved outside of a church building. Amen. Yes, ma'am.